Games are meant to be big events, and sometimes they just blow your mind. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 holy shit moments from recent games. Starting off at number 10, Bayonetta 3's Chapter 6 and 12. The Bayonetta games are known for their over-the-top insanity, but this game goes a step beyond in a totally holy shit madness territory. Almost every major boss in the game is so over the top and ridiculous that they'd be the final boss in any normal game, but here they're just another boss. Probably the two that stand out most to me are the bosses of chapter 6 and 12. You really just gotta see these to believe them. The first one in chapter 6 is your normal crazy boss modeled after the Monkey King from Journey to the West. Uh, he's got three forms. The first two you take on in a normal character action game way, but the third, this is where it gets interesting. For reasons, he becomes supercharged, so Bayonetta responds by ripping out her own heart and sacrificing it to a demon who also gets supercharged. Uh, this doesn't kill her. This is, this is these games. You don't have to know why, you just have to accept it. Now, for some reason, this demon decides that the best course of action is to fight the boss by uh, blowing bubbles at them. Like I said, you just gotta see it. It's one of the most ridiculous visuals I've ever seen. It's so incredibly goofy that any attempt to be sexy or whatever just completely falls to the wayside. I mean, look at this. What, what is happening? The boss of Chapter 12 somehow actually more ridiculous than this. And this is in a mission with an extended thriller parody in the middle of it for, for just no reason. other than to just melt your brain, I guess. So this time you gotta take on a swarm of mind controlling insects that seem unstoppable, but wait, you just so happen to have an opera singing frog demon at your disposal. Of course, let's try that. So that thing gets powered up, you fight the boss, an extended rhythm mini game where the frog demon sings a very fifth element song to kill the swarms of bugs. It's, it's one of those things you just gotta see, totally insane. At number 9, Elden Ring's Elevator. For a lot of people, the most memorable moment from Elden Ring. It's not the only surprising thing to find in the game, obviously, but for a lot of players, it's the first, and it's the moment where the game goes from just being an interesting take on an open world formula to something much more interesting in people's minds. I'll try to set the scene. It starts off in Limgrave, like the whole game. It's probably the most normal area of the game. There's a few scattered dungeons, nothing to really write home about, and it sets your expectations kind of low at first. One of the larger sections of the map is Mistwood, a forest filled with rune bears that can be a fair Fairly dangerous place starting out, but it's a place most new players will probably check out just because it's so close to the starting area. And while you're wandering around the misty forest, you might run into this large round building with an elevator in it. The first time I activated this thing, I assumed it just lead down to some kind of small cave dungeon similar to the other ones I found in the area, but the elevator just keeps going, like, and going, like deep, deeper, deep, deep, deep. And then you see these giant aqueducts in the distance and buildings. You realize it's not some little cave, but an entirely new area. It's not just a new location. It's an entire section of the map that's underground. A and you never really see stuff like this in open world games. This whole area is enormous. And even better, everything you see in the distance, you can actually go to. It's one of the most intriguing and exciting moments in the game. If they're gonna just make it so you can like randomly uncover an entire underground world, what else are you gonna find just exploring? Exploring. It's one of the few totally surprising player-driven moments of the year, and easily one of the best. And number eight is the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, the Stanley Parable 2. Everyone knew ahead of time this updated version of the Stanley Parable would have some new endings and new secrets in it, but developers tried to make us think that wouldn't be the case, and duh, it was obviously gonna happen. That's kind of the point of the game, to have different endings and subvert the expectations, so yeah. I knew there'd be some changes, but I didn't know how far they'd go, or the fact they basically hit an entire Stanley Parable sequel in the game. Like when you first boot the game up, it seems like everything's the same. It actually takes finding a few of the standard endings before anything new even starts to pop up. The first new thing you find is a door leading to new content, which ends up being pretty pathetic. There's a circle you can jump in. Wow. When the game throws its first big swerve at you and sends you to this hall of memories of the original version of the game, this concludes with a really dark and bizarre ending where you're trapped in a tiny room with the narrator with only a fast forward button. 
that eventually leaves you trapped in a desolate apocalyptic world. Then the game starts all over again, just like normal. But now the new content door leads you to the Stanley Parable 2, a, a gigantic new area filled with stuff. Things get stranger from there, including a bucket that you can take with you that changes all the old endings in the game into something completely different for some reason. Also, the title screen has a story too, like the game's bizarre. And number seven is it's the Cuphead DLC, The Secret Boss. Like, you know, for a, a game called Cuphead with this traditional cartoon look, the Delicious Last Course DLC came out this year, added some fantastic bosses to an already great game. But the most surprising thing, especially if you manage to find it yourself, is The Secret Boss. It's not one of those things that's impossible to find normally, but it's something that, like, you'll find it on your own. All you have to do is solve this simple puzzle on these tombstones. The contest winners all give you randomized clues, but you just need to touch the three tombstones in the correct order, which is slightly trickier than it seems, but it's certainly not impossible. You solve the puzzle, the center tombstone lights up, and you get the option of taking a nap. Things start getting creepy right from the loading screen as the normally happy hourglass is shattered and all the sand guts are spilling out of its glass body. When the loading finishes, it's when you take on this thing known as the angel and the devil. Uh, there's this creepy music and this bizarre stop motion rabbit skeleton looms over you and the fight starts. <laughs> Uh, like most people are going to die in seconds when you're first fighting this thing because of its cross-eyed gimmick and the devil and angel switch places whenever you turn. So any projectiles fired by the devil hurt you while any projectiles from the angel are harmless. Like it's a simple enough gimmick, but actually adjusting to it's pretty difficult to say the least. The regular game didn't have any secret bosses, so this thing was pretty unexpected. If its weird appearance didn't make you say holy shit, the brutal attack patterns are definitely gonna... And number six, Gotham Knights Final Boss. Like, regardless of your opinion of the game, the final boss goes pretty hard. Like, it's a pretty interesting and ballsy fight. The final area of the game leads into a Lazarus pit under Gotham, where Talia has revived the actually for real dead Batman using the Lazarus pit. The fact that Batman shows up alive again isn't really the shocker here. Like, you knew he was going to show up somehow. But the fact you actually have to fight him as a real boss, it, it caught me off guard. He's no joke either. He went full Street Fighter V sexy ride. You. He is not messing around. I assume that'd be it, but it's not. There's two full fights left. You gotta knock out Talia's health bar twice in a grueling test of endurance, which is pretty impressive for a game like this. All the Arkham games really had you fight a single final boss, but this game goes full Final Fantasy on you with the sequential bosses. The real surprise is kind of fighting Batman, though. It's a pretty cool climax to a game that might seem obvious in hindsight, but uh, I did not expect to fight Batman. Did it make the whole game worthwhile? Well, I insert Larry David gif here. And number five, A Plague Tale Requiem, King Hugo. Uh, this is a game that goes hard. Like, if you thought Last of Us Part Two was a downer of a game, you have not seen anything yet. This is a direct continuation of A Plague Tale Innocence. It starts off dark, and it only gets worse and worse for poor Amicia and Hugo. All you really need to know for this entry is the two main characters are siblings, and the little guy, Hugo, is kind of a magical conduit for a rat plague. He is a rat boy. He can control the rats. By the end of the game, that power goes completely out of control, and Hugo turns an entire city into a hellish wasteland of rats. This final section of the game turns into a literal abstract nightmare with actual tidal waves of rats, for lack of a better description. Like, I'm not so sure that it has anything to do with the tide, but it, that's what that looks like, right? Anyway, they consume pretty much everything in their path, and you pretty much have to desperately hide from it. It sounds crazy enough, but the visuals are really what sell the whole thing. For the most part, this series is set in mostly down-to-earth environments, but at the end, it goes pr pretty abstract, I guess, and it's actually fairly disturbing. The entire ending sequence is pretty shocking in its own right, but it's less of a holy shit thing and more kind of an incredible bummer. When I think holy shit, I think spectacle. And this run-up to the climax, it's easily the most spectacular thing in a Plague Tale Requiem, but uh, it's not going to make you feel good. And number four is Signalis Begin Again, taking inspiration from 90s anime like Neon Genesis Evangelion and also Silent Hill. 
kind of no wonder Signalis ended up one of the weirdest games of 2022. Most of this game is going to leave you too confused to really be shouting holy shit, but there is one moment that it got me hard. Like, it seems like this game is running up to the climax. You solve the final puzzle in this bizarre meat-filled other world. You open the door to what seems like your final destination, and then what seems like the final cutscene plays. It's a kind of unsatisfying conclusion, but it's an indie game that kind of comes with the territory. But after the short credits end, it takes you back to the main screen, and a, a lot of people probably shut the game off right then, but it's not the ending. There's a lot left to do. If you hit begin, the game starts over, but the events that play out are, are, are completely different. It seems like some kind of new game plus is actually just the rest of the game. From here, you go into the real final area and take on the real final boss, and that's when you get the for real this time ending. It's just as confusing, but at least there was a boss, and it seems a little more satisfying, I guess. It's kind of a nasty trick to pull on people, and I bet there's more than a few folks out there that actually fell for it and had no idea that the first ending wasn't the ending. But damn, if it is not a holy shit moment when you start a game over and you find out that you got a lot of game to go. And number three is High on Life, uh, the secret of the human haven. So High on Life, a pretty goofy game. Definitely worth a play. I enjoyed it. Watch my before you buy for my full opinion on it. Uh, but the plot is mostly an excuse for jokes. And it's like what I'm saying is it's far from serious. It's a fun game. It does its humor well. Sometimes doesn't know when to stop. But for the most part, it's enjoyable. Uh, but there's a point where it's actually really weirdly serious. The story of the game is that there's this alien cartel that's invaded Earth and is now using humans for drugs, like literally smoking them like a joint somehow. And at a certain point in the story, you're given a device that makes it so you can rescue any captured humans you find and teleport them to a human haven. The guy who gives it to you, Magistrate Klug, seems pretty straightforwardly nice, which immediately stands out in a game where everybody's insane or insanely rude, but it's not really a story game, so you just go along with it. There's a funny thing, though. When you summon a portal to rescue a human, you can actually go through the portal to the human haven. And if you platform up to the top, there's a mysterious locked door. So you go back to Klug's office after beating the game, and you can find a key card on his desk, which opens the door and reveals a bunch of secret rooms filled with dead humans that have been experimented on. Now, what's shocking about this is it is presented mostly serious with a pretty seriously creepy atmosphere. At the end of the lab, the true bad guy the game's revealed, this creepy looking scientist who also is not played for laughs at all, he just comes off as evil. He kills Klug right in front of you, and then he teleports away as a setup for the sequel. Uh, this moment is a double whammy. The secret ending uh, is in a goofy cartoon FPS, and it's surprisingly dark and sinister. Oh, also the final boss teleports Jack Black and Susan Sarandon for a cameo and immediately kills them, which is also pretty holy shit worthy. And number two is Tunic, The Patterns. Tunic is a game made up of holy shit moments. When you first boot it up, you really don't have any idea what's going on. It's set up like a standard Legend of Zelda style adventure, but the game goes uh, in a way where it slowly reveals previously mundane parts of the environment have a lot more going on with them. The game doesn't tell you anything, and it doesn't make the basic gameplay elements even clear. So discovering that you can do something as simple as sprint and level up your character kind of feel like a holy shit moment because you can play this game for hours without realizing either of those things are even possible. Now, the game doesn't block your progress by just making you find items. Instead, your progress is tied to your knowledge, like how much you've managed to figure out about the world. Learning how wells work or that you can pray to make things happen are, are game changers, but the biggest holy shit revelation is realizing the secret of the patterns. All over this game, you can see doors and background objects with these lines on them. Now, in most games, this would just be meaningless details, but they're essential in this game because a lot of secrets are hidden behind these patterns. They're not just details, they're codes telling you what to do. To activate these things, you need to input directions on your control to match the direction of the pattern. Uh, there's no specific place to do it, just as long as you're on the screen and you press the right directions, it works. It's genuinely mind-blowing when you finally figure it out, because it opens up the rest of the game so much, and you start seeing the patterns everywhere. It's an all-around brilliant game with some of the most satisfying Eureka moments of the past few years. And finally, at number one, God of War Ragnarok, the character switch. Had to put this in somewhere, right? The whole gimmick of the rebooted God of War series is that it's single camera following Kratos. For the entire first game, it sticks to the script and it doesn't deviate from him. It's a, a full constant. So when the camera suddenly wanders away from the big man out of nowhere, it's kind of huge. Like suddenly you're playing as Atreus, doing his own thing completely separate from Kratos. The God of War games have never had another playable character. Not since the first game 
game out back in 2005. That's 20 years with Kratos as the playable character. And then out of nowhere, you're playing his son. The funny thing is it's intentionally jarring. Like it doesn't happen after Kratos gets injured or anything. It just happens. And then we find out that Atreus has his own story going on the entire time. Now, there is some controversy. Uh, some people aren't crazy about the amount of time you spend in Ragnarok as the boy of war. But that first switch over is, is pretty damn surprising. And a quick bonus for you, the real number one of the year. Uh, we got to talk about this. It's probably the most insane plot twist of 2022. Uh, it's Spark the Electric Jester 3. So, little background. Spark the Electric Jester is Sonic the Hedgehog, but he is not blue. He's yellow. He mixed in a little Kirby, a little Mega Man X. Put it on top of Sonic Adventure, but made much, much less janky. And you pretty much have Spark the Electric Jester, three at least. One was 2D, two was 3D, but I would say that three is really the good 3D one. Not that two is bad, but I digress. There's barely a story here until the very end. Uh, you travel down to this underground bunker, which contains an entire city. As you go, these weird glitches start appearing everywhere, which is odd, but whatever. Then you get to the final boss, who reveals the absolutely bonkers twist that you've already failed your mission, and some evil computer has wiped out all of humanity. You, this weird little yellow cartoon man, you're dead. This is just a Matrix-style simulation. In reality, everything's destroyed, and you've been replaying your failure for a thousand years in an underground bunker the whole time. The whole thing is completely nuts. And there's so much more, like how the guy you're hunting was actually the hero, and you're kind of responsible for the destruction of mankind. Like you, a little yellow dude who runs fast. It's melodramatic to the extreme in a game where, seriously, there really wasn't any story up to this point. It was 100% go through levels, beat the bad guy. Like that's the game up till this moment. It's pretty ambitious for an indie game. I gotta give you that. And I don't know if I was laughing because of how ridiculous it is, or because it's so uncomfortable that they did this. I, I don't know. It's like an I have no mouth, but I must scream level of grim in a game uh, that, that looks like this. This is what it looks like. Highly recommend this game. Would play it again. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero. And we'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.